Welcome to the Blakely Health Innovation Series uh, on the Wellness Web Webinar. This is Navigating Our New Reality. My name is Jillian Howard and I'm the Interim Vice Pre or President and CEO of the Toronto Rehab Foundation, which supports the incredible work of Toronto Rehab. Um, Toronto Rehab is the leading global leader in research and rehabilitation, and we help people and patients live an active, healthier, and more independent life. Uh, Toronto Rehab is part of the University Health Network and has seven sites located in Toronto, Ontario, supporting the recovery and return back to work of individuals affected by aging, uh, their health conditions, including brain and spinal cord injuries, heart disease, stroke, cancer, and more. Thank you for joining our webinar today. We have hundreds of people who have signed up and uh, people will be joining us in progress. People from across the country, from the greater Toronto area, and some from India as well. A welcome to my colleagues at University Health Network who will be our speakers today. And I'm gonna take a moment to extend on behalf of myself and I'm sure all of the viewers an incredible thank you to all of the health professionals who could, whose commitment over the past three months has helped to guide us safely through the various phases of the pandemic. Just before we begin today's session, I would like to acknowledge our sponsor, sponsors whose generosity has made today's webinar possible. Lickralim Capital, Raymond James, Wellwise, which is presented by Shoppers Drug Mart, McLeish Orlando Lawyers, Oatley Vigman Lawyers, 337, Bayer, Scotiabank, and the Canada India Foundation. As a reminder, this is an interactive webinar, and at the end of the session, we will have a question and answer forum. We encourage you to participate, participate by sending in your questions to trf at uhn.ca. It's on the screen. It's also located at the bottom of the slides you will be seeing on the screen. Today's topic, Navigating Our New Reality, is designed to share with advance, advice, tips, and practical strategies on how to safely return back to the community and work life as restrictions are gradually lifted during the pandemic. Today's speakers have been an important part of UHN's response to the pandemic. I'm, I'm going to introduce them now. They all hold senior leadership positions or roles at UHN and they can provide their experts insight into the impacts and effects of the pandemic on the work and community living and our healthcare institutions. The first will be Dr. Susie Hota, who is our Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control. Susie has played a huge role in keeping our patients and our staff safe throughout the pandemic. I've worked with her for many years and uh, her safety first is her mantra. Our second uh, speaker, is Dr. Mark Bailey, who is our physiatrist in chief and program medical director at the Toronto Rehab. His interest among many things is, I think during the pandemic has been about virtual care and how we work with patients and keep them safe at home. Our last speaker is Dr. Susan Abbey, who is our psychiatrist in chief at UHN. Susan has provided all kinds of support to our staff and patients throughout this. She's the person who hopefully will keep us sane through the pandemic because we all know uh, that this has affected our mental health and well-being. So the first uh, presenter is Dr. Susie Hota. Susie. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for that introduction. I'll, I'll be starting off by talking about how we can actually balance risk with trying to live our lives as we move through the different stages of this pandemic. And I know some of the viewers here are coming from different parts of the world and you may be experiencing different things, but I think the overall principles are applicable across uh, the globe as we sort of wax and wane in terms of the number of cases that we're experiencing of COVID-19. Next slide, please. I'll start off just by quickly reviewing where we're at in this pandemic. And as I mentioned, many of us are experiencing different um, parts of the pandemic. And at the very top of the slide, what I've got is uh, somewhat already a bit outdated. It's a summary of the number of cases across different parts of the world. And you can see that the number of new cases of COVID-19 that are occurring globally continue to rise and actually quite rapidly. We're at a very interesting stage where that the, we're in the global pandemic is really quite active um, and driven by a rapid explosive growth of cases in parts of the world like the United States, Brazil, 
uh, and we're seeing some of the largest numbers in cases uh, being reported in a 24 hour period in the last couple of weeks. Whereas the lower curve that you see on, on the screen here is showing what our epidemic curve is in Canada. And we're, we're really experiencing a different uh, story here. So in recent weeks, we've seen a really nice dramatic decrease in the number of cases over time, uh, showing us as we're on the downslope of this curve into a period of time where we can consider trying to open up and, and reduce some of the restrictions we've put in place to manage the transmission of the, of the epidemic. Next slide, please. So what's all the fuss about though? I'm, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about COVID-19 uh, infection itself, but I did wanna take one moment to con compare and contrast with another very familiar uh, respiratory virus that we, we see, and that's influenza. So COVID-19 and influenza are both um, things that we see infecting humans and causing respiratory illness. So they're very similar clinical presentation, signs and symptoms. People develop coughs, shortness of breath, fever, feeling generally unwell. So one of the main similarities between the two is that they can look quite similar when you're affected by them. And along the same lines, similar types of people are more vulnerable to getting these infections. So those with underlying lung disease, heart disease, immune compromise, for example, seem to be more affected by both of these infections. Because they're both respiratory viruses, they share the mode of transmission. And I'll talk about that a little more detail in the uh, next slide as I discuss how you can actually get COVID-19 infection. And and influenza is seasonal, um, whereas COVID-19 may or may not end up being seasonal in terms of what we see with the pattern of transmission over time. Right now, we're in the midst of a global pandemic, so it's a little hard to know it. It's far less predictable what we're going to deal with um, in upcoming years if COVID-19 becomes one of our other seasonal viruses. There are some really notable differences between the two, though. So this is SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19 infection, is completely novel within the human population. This means that no humans have experienced infection with this prior to the beginning of this, this pandemic, and so we're all susceptible to infection. There's no pre-existing immunity to help protect some people um, from getting infected. So that's really critical because you have this ability for it to transmit quite efficiently from person to person. We also see that um, from what we're experiencing in the epidemiology, analyzing the epidemiology of the outbreak, is that this virus is being transmitted more efficiently than influenza virus from person to person. Mm -hmm. So it seems as though it, it is more infectious than the influenza virus. It also appears to be more lethal. So overall, our estimates are the case fatalities rate of COVID-19 infection is somewhere between one and, and up to 3% in, in most populations where we've seen larger outbreaks. With influenza, we have a moderately effective vaccine. It's not perfect, but 40 to 60% of people who get the influenza vaccine every year are protected from infection. Hopefully we'll be in a similar place where we have a vaccine available for COVID-19 someday soon, but at, at the moment we don't have that tool at our fingertips. So we do have to manage it differently. And finally, some of the secondary complications that people get when they get infected with COVID-19 are quite different from influenza virus infection. And that includes having a propensity to have clotting uh, events within the body, for example. And we're seeing this very um, pronounced inflammatory response that can happen after children are infected with COVID-19 um, that is likely driven by the immune response to the virus. Next slide, please. So I've already referred to transmission and how this is important for us to, to understand the dynamics of movement of this virus and how we can actually protect ourselves uh, from COVID-19 infection. As a respiratory virus, it is believed to be primarily transmitted through larger respiratory droplets. So these are droplets that are generated when you cough or sneeze or, um, are, and are infected with the virus. And these virus droplets really can only go about two meters in distance before they land onto surfaces. Now that's uh, causing kind of drawing an artificial line. We recognize that there's a bit of a, uh, a spectrum of the size of the droplets that are generated anytime someone's infected with COVID-19 and coughs and sneezes. Um, and so there are some smaller particles that can be transmitted a little further as well, but the vast majority of that transmission risk is within the two meters of a person who's infected because of these larger droplets that are generated. Now, because it can also contaminate surfaces around that person who's infected, um, 
there's a component of what we call contact transmission also involved. So that means that if a, a table in front of that, a person who's coughed or sneezed has droplets land on it and you happen to touch the surface of that table right after that, um, there could be viable virus that's still on that surface of the table. And if your hands then touch your nose, your, your mouth, or your what we call mucous membranes, your eyes, you may then infect yourself. So you could introduce a virus into the parts of the body where there's cells that are able to be infected with the virus and you can get sick. Next slide, please. So recognizing how it's being transmitted, um, it's important to think about what we can do to try and stop that transmission. Uh, and this really speaks to what are we seeing on a larger scale when we look at populations where COVID-19 is active, how infectious is it? And I, I mentioned it's more infectious than the influenza virus. One of the ways that we can measure this is by calculating what we call an effective reproductive number. And essentially what this means is you're looking at how many additional people can be infected by one person infected with this virus. And so the higher the reproductive number, the more risky it is for people, the, the more infectious the agent is, the lower the number is, obviously less infectious it is. But this is not a static number. This is something that we can influence or affect, which is why we call it the effective reproductive number. And so if we put certain measures in place, then we are able to bring that reproductive number below zero, or sorry, below one. And that's the goal to actually be able to control an epidemic, try to keep it below one and sustain it at that level. And so if you see on the right hand side or the one side of the screen, there's a graph that outlines, this is from a study where they published the experience in Wuhan, China, as they implemented progressively a number of different public health type measures to control um, the epidemic. And early on, it, without any strong interventions, you can see that the estimated reproductive number was approaching four at its peak. But as they started to do things like um, you know, lock down the city, you can see a massive decrease in the number of cases and, and therefore also the reproductive number um, so that they were able to eventually through centralized quarantine treatment, improving the capacity to provide medical treatment as well on, in addition to the lockdown measures, get this below one for a sustained period of time and therefore interrupt and completely stop the, the, the major spread of the epidemic. So the kinds of measures that we put in place to stop transmission in broad terms include infection control measures. And this is, you know, hand hygiene, trying to wear masks or personal protective equipment to stop transmission from person to person. Public health measures like closures of schools, um, interrupting um, uh, businesses from or stopping businesses from running, uh, locking down the city and restricting the movement of people. Uh, travel restrictions, and vaccine, of course, which is what we're looking forward to. Next slide, please. So in, broad, in broader terms, again, the things that we need to do to try and stop transmission include improving our detection. So trying to get everyone who's symptomatic and could have COVID-19 tested and getting them isolated so they can't infect others. And also applying that principle to the close contacts of those people so that they cannot expose other people. Um, and an important principle there is that in the days before you actually get COVID-19 symptoms, if you're infected, people can be infectious to others. So that's really important in terms of the contact tracing side of, of managing this. Protecting yourself in public. So there are a few things you can do, like just being aware of what public health uh, measures are being recommended, but also distancing yourself physically from others when you're in public areas, maintaining more than two meters wearing a mask or a face covering when you're in more crowded areas where you can't do that. And of course, sanitizing your hands and surfaces very frequently so that they don't uh, end up being contaminated. Next slide, please. Just another word on masks. I won't spend too much time talking about this, but we kind of use that term quite liberally and it includes both face protection, but also masks that we use in medical settings, um, cloth masks that people have been making in their homes, as well as these respirators that we use in healthcare facilities and other places where you need to have very, um, very effective filtration of the air around you before you breathe it. Now that's only really applicable to the healthcare facilities um, that are caring for COVID-19 patients in this pandemic. Um, but with masks, there is growing evidence out there to support 
the use of masks in general public um, kind of settings, not just for source control, so to prevent those who are infected from releasing the infectious viral virus particles and exposing others, but also for those who are around um, individuals where they don't know if they may be infectious or not, um, to prevent them from acquiring the infection. But there are a number of things that you need to consider in terms of mask use, like um, there are risks of self-contamination if you're not putting it on or taking it off properly. So you need to be comfortable with how to actually use your mask well. And some people do develop some problems with skin irritation or breathing problems as well. Next slide, please. So I'll quickly go through some of the things we can do to mitigate risk during gatherings as we open up. So I, again, the maintaining two meters is very important. Limiting the size of your gatherings and try not to hug or kiss. Um, if you can hold them outdoors, that's really one of the things we'd recommend or in opening the windows in your home as you do so. Uh, making sure nobody's unwell. So, you know, really trusting those that you're inviting to your gatherings and not sharing food because you can actually have contamination of food reservoirs and, and cause infections that way. Singing is controversial, but there have been some studies that have shown large outbreaks in choirs um, that have been sitting, singing in closed environments. So it's currently not being encouraged. And you might wanna consider the use of non-medical masks. Next slide, please. Now, what can we do with childcare uh, in childcare settings? We don't know a lot about transmission within uh, children, partly because they often are not coming forward for testing and we've also been protecting our children more. So it's a bit of an artificial situation. So we don't really know, but we suspect that they are less severely infected and less susceptible potentially to infection, but we're not entirely clear. Um, and we don't think that children at the moment are major spreaders of COVID-19 from the data that we have in examining clusters of infections in families. Next slide. So what the kinds of things we're trying to do though, recognizing that we have limited information on childcare uh, settings is physically distance. And so some schools or childcare um, uh, agencies like daycares are staggering the classes or reducing the sizes, staggering the breaks that they have and using online learning as well. Um, but also improving the ventilation in some of the older buildings where childcare and schooling is occurring and having some physical barriers in place. Uh, we talk about administrative controls like educating people on policies of sick policy, sick leave policies, but also what to do for cleaning your hands, et cetera, and enhancing the amount of cleaning, cleaning that's happening in the environment. Now, uh, masks are not practical for use with children a lot, but it is something to consider. Um, but, you know, young kids really don't tolerate them. So under the age of two, it's not recommended at all. Next slide. If you happen to have to care for someone with COVID-19 infection, then there are a few things that you can do, mostly covered in the slides I've already talked about, but you can dedicate the bathroom of that person um, so that others are not using it, if that's possible. You wear a mask or gloves when you're actually contacting that person's body fluids or you're in very close proximity to actually provide care. Don't share things like towels or utensils, eating utensils, and uh, but regular dishwashing of your utensils is fine. And cleaning your high touch areas in the household um, are also, uh, that's important. But usual household cleaners are effective at getting rid of this virus. You don't have to use anything special really. And finally, washing your hands. I can't emphasize that enough, but very frequently, and especially before eating or, or uh, preparing food. Next slide, please. Final word is about immunity. So you can achieve immunity to this virus. And this is really what we're banking on to actually um, end this pandemic is having people immune to it. So we don't have um, transmission the way that we, we are seeing right now. Natural immunity occurs if you happen to get COVID-19 and you recover from it. We actually don't know how long lasting that immunity is. And with other respiratory viruses, like other coronaviruses, we see that they're seasonal. In other words, your immunity does not last longer than more than uh, three or four months in many of those cases. We're hoping that's not the case here, but we recognize that might be something we have to deal with. You can also get immune if you've been vaccinated and it's an effective vaccine and there are multiple vaccine trials that are out there right now. So a lot of effort into it, but it takes uh, you know years to often develop vaccines and get them out there. So let's hope that with the right incentive, we'll be able to get it out there quicker. And then a word about herd immunity. So this really refers to if enough people become infected and immune to it, then it actually confers um, protection to those around them, even if they are officially susceptible. Uh, this is not something we're trying to promote. We're not asking people to go out and get infected so that you can protect those around you. That is uh, really kind of unethical in many ways and uh, you know, subjects people to very life-threatening illness. Um, but it is a concept that's been discussed. So I, I did want to mention it here. 
so that's, I think, all I wanted to say. And um, I think we're taking questions at the end. So I'll move on to Dr. Bailey. We are. Thanks very much, to Dr. Hota. Uh, and uh, now to Dr. Mark Bailey. Hi, good afternoon, and thanks, uh, Dr. Hoda, for a great overview. She, uh, Dr. Hoda has been an amazing leader for us through this pandemic. And um, I, what I wanted to talk about was some of the changes in the way that care is provided during this pandemic. And so if we go to the first slide, um, I, I, you may not know if you, if this slide is animated, that on average um, in our last year in UHN, which is University Health Network, is like many other hospitals that thousands of people visit us for an appointment each week, that we're typically operating at 105% of our planned occupancy, and we have close to 4,000 procedures going on. In the middle of the pandemic, all of a sudden, our hospital occupancy was occupied at about 65%. Our ICU, of course, was almost full with COVID patients, and all elective surgeries have been postponed, and we're down to about thir a third of what we normally do, and visits to the emergency room were 30 to 50% of the normal. So the question really is, what happened to all the patients? What, how are people getting care during this challenging time where you cannot visit? And so if, if we go to the next slide, um, the, uh, we recognized immediately that uh, COVID created a number of challenges for us in the healthcare environment. People were afraid of going to the emergency room, which we are concerned about because people with other illnesses, cancer, congestive heart failure, infections, may not show up when they really should be showing up. Um, we knew that many of the outpatient clinics had closed to visit. Um, there were no visitors and family members in hospitals, and we know they play an important role in advocating for their family members as well as uh, providing some incidental care. Um, we, we also had a problem in that we didn't have enough initially personal protective equipment to open up those offices. And of course, right at the start, um, we had limited access to the ability to securely and privately connect with people in video conference network. So really over the next few minutes, if we go to the next slide, what I really wanted to quickly give you an overview of how do you get your healthcare during this pandemic? Um, some of the do's and don'ts um, from, uh, of telehealth um, and how you can prepare for uh, your, help your healthcare professional, your physician, your nurse practitioner, and some of the things that exist right now that you can use. And um, so, talk a little bit about our field of telerehabilitation uh, rehabilitation and some of the things we're thinking about. And finally, just sort of how you might be able to support us in this journey. So if we go to the next slide. Um, one thing we do want to leave you with is a lot of people are afraid of going to the emergency room, but you should be going to the emergency room. Uh, most emergency rooms are available. Um, you can call ahead if you're really worried um, to telehealth, but ERs have made a lot of efforts to isolate people who have suspected COVID. We created a virtual COVID assessment room, which included a camera, and, and people were able to take their own blood pressure and oxygen, and it'll really allow people to be protected and isolated from uh, exposure. And we're really concerned, as I mentioned, that if people delay getting the help they need, that their condition will worsen. Go to the next slide. So you should also, if you have a condition you need help for, you should contact your healthcare professional, your family physician. The Ministry of Health, uh, to its credit, quickly created a new fee code, which allows doctors to do assessments over the phone that didn't exist before the pandemic. Um, we know that also the Ontario Telehealth Network has rapidly implemented a system that people can connect with their individual computers. And of course, many of you will be familiar with Zoom and, and it's a private way of connecting with people. Um, and we do still have in-person visits. Our numbers are about a quarter of what they normally would be. But for urgent matters, we still put up, bring people in and we give them the appropriate PPE um, when needed. So it's important you do contact your healthcare. Um, so here's some of the things that virtual visits are good, that are safe. Um, we know that uh, there's good evidence that mental health issues can be dealt with using video conferencing and virtual care. Many skin problems through photographs can be helped. Uh, minor infections, uh, urinary or sinus can be dealt with, sore throats, um, eye redness, um, 
sexual health issues, uh, travel-related health care, and a um, number of things can be monitored using uh, home devices and lab, lab tests. And certainly doctors can review those results with you over the phone or a video conference. Um, some of the things that telehealth is challenged with, if you have chest pain, shortness of breath, loss of vision, loss of hearing or sudden weakness or numbness suggestive of a stroke or a neurological condition, you need to go to an emergency department. Um, if, you, if you have a really bad cough, you, obviously your doctor can't listen to your chest, um, and this is a challenge. If you have abdominal problems then, uh, or digestive problems, this may be hard to diagnose, as well as if you have a fall or a fracture, it's going to be awfully hard to make sure that it's safe without imaging. And similarly, exam examining your ear is challenging using video conferencing. So, um, how you can help? Well, we would like you to come prepared for your visits with a list of your symptoms, when they started, any data that you have recorded from your home monitors, we're going to talk about that in a moment, information about any contacts with similar symptoms so that we can do contact tracing, and if you haven't seen that doctor who you've got talk, uh, talking to, obviously a relevant health history, and it's always critical to bring your prescription medications, um, and if you don't have a list, then have your pill containers at hand. Go to the next slide. So obviously there's a number of pieces of equipment. Some of these are now smart, they're internet enabled. You can, we have blood pressure cuffs that are uh, really reasonably priced. They range now between 50 and, 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 and $80. Uh, you can even get them less expensive. And they, they're a great way of monitoring your pulse and your blood pressure. You have, uh, for those people who have conditions like congestive heart failure where they need to monitor their weight, their weight scale, uh, thermometers, there's the simple ones like shown, or there's the ear ones that you can purchase. And of course, we increasingly see heart monitors that are working um, and doing a lot of the work that we uh, would do uh, as, as, as clinicians um, that are existing. And, and, and certainly uh, a lot of work going on at UHN from some of our cardiology colleagues on monitoring people at home. Uh, Dr. Heather Ross is a leader in this field. So we go to the next slide. Um, so, uh, there's also a number of apps for healthcare. Obviously, it's really hard to know which one is good and which one's not so good. Um, that's why in our field in rehabilitation, there's a great group in the UK who've come up with a website called My Therapy, which is um, a rating uh, where they rate the quality of apps. And they have many, many apps that are good for stroke, blood pressure, health monitoring, and they really do a nice job of rating them and telling you what it does. Um, and, uh, um, and, and I would encourage you, if you're looking for some health apps, to consider this one because it is well done. Um, the next slide. Um, so we know that we uh, immediately had closure of our outpatient rehab. It was very difficult. And our therapists had very rarely been using uh, technology um, on a day-to-day -day basis for this, and they, they had some concerns about this. Uh, this picture of uh, Nina, you can see, uh, who is one of our therapists. Um, uh, she, uh, she, she's uh, actively working with one of our, our patients. Um, and, and we know that we, we have concerns about safety, you know, obviously monitoring people's effort. Normally, you can tell how much muscle tone there is and effort and their blood pressure, and we, of course, worry about falls. From the perspective of people who are receiving tele-rehab, obviously they have to set up the technology. Um, they also have to make sure that the exercise they do are, are safe and balanced. Unfortunately, many people, because of cognitive difficulties or other things, need a caregiver to help them set up the equipment, and many of them are not technologically savvy, and this has been a challenge for us. And of course, you don't have the same quality of exercise equipment in the home. If we go to the next slide, um, this is some of the work that we've done through uh, the support of the Toronto Rehab Foundation as well as um, research uh, uh, granting agencies at the KITE, uh, which is uh, the Rehab Research Institute at Toronto Rehab. Um, we've developed uh, sensors uh, for tests that you can take home this mask. Um, you wear this mask on your face and it can diagnose sleep apnea. Uh, this uh, sensing mat is a pressure sensor that connects to your mobile phone for people with spinal cord injury or stroke who may not recognize that they can't feel that they're developing skin breakdown, this uh, sensimat will tell them that they've spent too much time or that there's pressure that might be 
be worrisome for skin breakdown. Okay, next, take it to the next slide. Um, Dr. Andrea Iaboni, who's a, a geriatric psychiatrist with us and a researcher, is one of the leaders of the Ambient Project, where we're doing automated monitoring of individuals on our uh, specialized dementia unit and looking for people who are at high risk of falls as well as restlessness and agitation that might lead to injury. And um, we're, we're, we're analyzing how we can use this technology to monitor people in their homes. We go to the next slide. Um, and then we're also uh, very interested in um, wearable technology and garments that you can measure. Um, these, this is the, uh, uh, um, this is a garment that can provide stimulation to your muscles um, for people. Um, and then we also have garments that may be able to monitor your heart rate. Sorry about the background noise. If we go to the next slide. Um, so the take home message is really is, it is time to take care of your health and that you shouldn't put off the visits that you need to have. We all have to avoid, uh, we've all been sitting um, a lot during this pandemic and it's important for us to get back to exercising. Uh, we believe that telehealth is likely here to stay and there's a number of ways you can participate in that. It does have some limitations um, and some of our research at UHN is working to improve our ability to monitor people in their homes and deliver remote care safely. So uh, that's my messages and I'm uh, happy to pass it on to our next speaker, Dr. Abby. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, so uh, the, the constant reminder in, in Zoom calls is you may be on mute, Dr. Abby, so uh, make sure you're off mute and uh, we'll go to your presentation. Great. Well, thank you so much for inviting me today. So I wanted to talk about some of the mental health challenges with navigating our new reality. If I could have the next slide, please. So when we think about COVID-19, it really has brought brought many, many mental health challenges. It's brought um, for lots of people, uh, depression, sadness, loss. Um, sadly, people have, have lost family members either through COVID or through other illnesses, but their ability to, to really mourn in the way we, we typically do in our various cultural groups has been really changed because of the need for physical distancing and then the challenges around gathering together. I think if you haven't had anxiety during COVID, there's something wrong with you. Um, but for some people, it really has become a higher, um, more uh, concerning um, uh, level. In terms of uh, hopelessness, I think the frustration and just the day-to-day -day and on and on um, quality of this has been really challenging and for people who live in areas sort of like uh, we do in the GTN and are finally looking at opening up that's going to be helpful. Certainly dealing with uncertainty has been a huge challenge for folks and you know I often think about some of my colleagues who um, kind of feel like they are you know the kind of M empresses uh, of their destiny and they can control everything and you could go down to um, Starbucks and get a 142 degree, one and a half pump, you know, skim milk with no foam latte. And that feeling that uh, particularly for those of us who are more, um, uh, you know, live in Canada, have some economic advantage that we really can control everything. And this has been a huge reminder that we can't. There are folks who have had acute uh, stress responses and post-traumatic uh, stress responses. And also, um, I think very common that there have been relationship stresses uh, related to either confinement and people having to share space or to not being able to see people that, um, that we love and are connected with as often as we want. And then there are a whole series of stresses related to parenting and co-parenting and grandparenting during COVID. So um, much of what's been written in the popular media suggests that everybody is falling apart mentally. What's been very interesting in some of the research to date is that there certainly are a significant number of people, and depending on the study you look at, that number is different, but somewhere between maybe 20 and 40 percent who are having, you know, significant problems at this time. And, and for those folks, I think it really is important to reach out to your family physician as a first step and, um, and get some support and uh, try to look at what might be helpful. I think the good news on the other hand is that uh, the majority of people have really managed to 
kind of weather their way through this. And although you know, I think most people are, are really tired out. So what I wanted to spend most of my time talking about was um, how we can build our resilience. So if we could move to the next slide, please. Um, you know, when I first started in psychiatry, the thought basically was that you kind of got your aliquot of res resilience. And, you know, that might have been related to your childhood experiences, your upbringing, your genetics, but you had whatever you had, and that was what you had, and there wasn't much to do about it. Really, over the last 10 years, there's a huge amount of research that shows that we can build our capacity for resilience. Um, in some ways, just having gotten through this episode of COVID is going to confirm more resilience because it's been hard, uh, but we've gotten through. But there are also choices that we can make in daily life that really help. And um, to help remember them, people talk about the five C's of resilience. So control, connection, commitment, caring, and calming. And I'll say something about each of those. So if we go to the next slide around control, I think it's really helpful for all of us to work on kind of what is out of my control and what is in my control and things that are outside of our control to try to just come to terms with them. And um, I'm always telling people don't add fuel to the fire. And with my Starbucks story, I was, you know, uh, alluding to how much control lots of us feel we have. And COVID has really shown us we don't <laughs> about big things, right? But I, I can't find the vaccine. Um, I can't make it go away. I can't suddenly go to, to the holiday that I wanted to do. So some things are out of my control and it's probably better to not spend a lot of time uh, focusing on those or worrying about those. What is really helpful though to spend time on is what is in my control. What are the choices that I could make and even small um, little choices every day that might uh, confer some greater ease in my daily life. So I think really important around managing news and social media. Uh, for some people that news and social media are helpful for a lot of people. I think they're very, uh, very disruptive and distressing and disturbing. Um, I always say to people, I think choosing kindness, that all of us are stressed and that if we can be a little bit kinder to people, that has benefit in making us feel better and in building our resilience. And it's also a better thing for the world. I think we can choose things that help us to feel better. And I'll say a little bit more about that um, in a couple of minutes. And I think there's a lot of evidence that shows that acts of altruism, of these, you know, doing tangible things for the people that are in our in our circle or in a broader sense in philanthropy can be really helpful for people in gaining a sense of control and fostering greater resilience in the face of these challenges. If you turn to the next uh, slide for us, that's really around connections and connections are an absolutely essential part of being human. For some of us, or for most of us probably, connections are with other human beings. For some of us, the most important connections in our lives are with animals, or with ideas or politics or art or beauty or music, but really knowing what it is that my connections are, what's important to me, and how can I actualize them, realize them, be in touch with them in the face of the restrictions of COVID. One of the things that's been really um, hard, and I, I notice that every day in my life is how much COVID-19 has fostered uh, kind of an us and them mentality. So, you know, I am I know that I'm not sick, but I'm sure you are. And you know that you're not sick, but you're sure I am. And everybody feeling that they have to pull apart from each other. And I think that that's very challenging. One of the things usually when people talk about the, uh, you know, what's the response to stress, there's a lot of um, talk given to fight and flight. But there's more recently people have um, described a response called tend and befriend that under um, periods of very high stress, instead of fight or flight, we could choose to tend and befriend. We could take care of ourselves, we could tend to those we love, we could be kind to people. And that in doing those things, we really, really help uh, our own inner stress physiology to settle down and to, to be much better. Uh, we have to remember that it's physical distancing, not social distancing that we're being called to do. And, um, that uh, we can find ways of being connected socially. And I think really, um, again, if people have the means to do so, using technology to foster connections is really helpful. 
um, you know, over the internet, amazing things. I know people who have cocktail parties, dinner parties, dance parties, watch movies together, play games together. Um, people who phone people. Um, there's the concept of COVID buddies. Um, so picking somebody uh, who you would promise that you're going to check in on uh, at some predetermined uh, frequency so that and that you can be real with about how you're doing or not. Uh, I think lots of people have in this kind of tend and befriend mode have chosen to take on uh, several people who live alone or people who aren't as well socially connected and to connect with them. And that is something that can be very helpful in managing our own stress. Uh, and also sometimes looking at past friends that we've lost uh, track of just because of the busyness of daily life. And now that we have a little bit more time connecting with them can be helpful. If we turn to the next slide, uh, the sea of commitment. And so the dictionary uh, describes commitment as the state or quality of being dedicated to a cause, activity, et cetera. So I ask myself, I encourage other people to ask themselves, you know, what are you committed to? And how can you live out those commitments during COVID? So maybe there are things that you can't do that you would otherwise do, but maybe there are ways that you can uh, live out those commitments. And, you know, when we come, everybody's hoping when we come out of COVID, but, you know, might there be lessons from what we've gone through that may influence how we decide to use our time and our resources moving forward? And are there potentially new commitments that we might want to make or current commitments that we might want to um, modify based on COVID? So I think focusing on how to actualize those commitments in the face of our challenges is very helpful. And then if we can turn to the next slide, we have got C, which is caring. And in some ways that's run through a lot of what I've talked about. I think caring for ourselves, caring for others, and really recognizing that self-care is the foundation for both our mental and our physical health. And this is a really an ideal time for us to tune up self-care, to look at you know, what we might uh, tweak. So um, you know, I decided in my own life, I'm somebody who tends to burn the candle at both ends, but that um, sleep is one of the most important and powerful things that you can do for yourself and to help um, have good, um, uh, immune functions. So I've really been working on my number one priority in COVID has been to get my sleep every night. Uh, for some people, it's exercise, uh, optimizing nutrition. People have often talked about the COVID-19, meaning COVID-19 pounds from uh, eating junk food, but trying to eat healthier. And particularly if you've got a little bit more time and you can um, can make, uh, make more of your food. If we go to the next slide, um, it also shows, you know, I think finding small pleasures in daily life is really important. There's lots of research that says that uh, you have more troubles with stress if you've got very big stressors in your life or then the next generation was little stressors. And more recently, I think people have seen that as long as you have small little doses of pleasure, and they can be really small, enjoying the scent of a, a tea or a coffee or the smell of a, a soap or shampoo in the shower or the feeling of the water on your body in the shower. If you can find those small pleasures in daily life, that's extraordinarily helpful. I think for many people, laughing every day is important. I have developed one of the world's best collections of COVID-19 memes. Um, that is very helpful for me. I think cultivating optimism very early in the um, pandemic, one of my patients said to me, uh, she just thinks at the end of every day, we're one day closer to the vaccine. And so I've taken that on too. And I think there's great wisdom there and being kind. And then if we go to our last C in the next slide, and that is calming. And there are lots of different approaches to use for calming oneself. And it's really about finding one or ones that work for you because everybody's a little bit different in this way. But you know the feelings that we've talked about are very normative. People need to be able to um, to talk about them, to express them. It's fine to ask for help. You know, I think if you look at your whole sort of uh, social network, as long as one person's standing, they can support the rest of the group. It may be a bad day for everybody else. Really helpful for us to burn off excess uh, anxious energy, and that's tied up with exercise. Whole lots of different things you can use around breath for calming. Um, and then calming skills and, uh, and calming down. And I'm not sure if we go to the next slide, if the resources show or whether we're gonna slow those. Yeah, so family doc is incredibly helpful. 
Uh, there is a COVID-19 special uh, content on a wide variety of platforms. I really like the 10% Happier one, Common Headspace meditation applications have free content. And then last slide um, has uh, some other Google or YouTube. If you just put any of those terms into your Google uh, engine or your YouTube, you're going to find hundreds of examples that you can uh, listen along with. And for mindfulness meditation, um, uh, mark.ucla.edu is helpful. So hopefully those will help you in, uh, in moving forward into this next phase of COVID. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Abby. Um, we're now going to go to a, a question and answer session. And I think I will start with the questions that have been sent in. I have a number of other questions, uh, but I'm going to go to the ones on the screen. Um, Susie, there are questions about um, how long would it take herd immunity to take effect if it actually works? Um, so can you, uh, Dr. Hoda, can you um, comment on herd immunity? Herd immunity? Sure. So I, I very briefly address this uh, in my presentation. Herd immunity is when others uh, around you have developed immunity to, a, to an infection. And just by virtue of that, you're protected in that the risk of getting exposed to something um, is reduced. In general, when we rely on things like herd immunity for measles protection, for example, you need to have very high vaccination rates in order for that to be effective. So, you know, in the order of 90, 95% of people being uh, immune in order to protect others. So, you know, in the current context, it's probably not a practical thing for us to think about unless we have an excellent vaccine that comes out and uh, and is available and can be rolled out to everybody very rapidly. So uh, I can't really comment on how long it would take for that to happen because it really would be dependent on an effective vaccine. Um, the next question is, it, it's, <laughs> it's about uh, Trump Pence and most of their staff members are not taking the necessary precautions and, and why are they not yet infected? That's pretty hard, Susie, from, uh, from an individual. But, but can you talk about the prevalence that we're seeing of COVID-19 in the community from what we know? Uh, and then uh, what situations are really the problematic ones? Yeah, so I mean, the question's really talking about the circumstances in the US, which are quite different, dramatically different from what's happening in Canada. And, and interesting, we do share a border, that border is closed. Um, but, uh, you know, very, very different stories being told across that border. In Canada, in most parts of Canada, even the higher prevalence areas like Toronto or Montreal, the, the uh, total number of people who have COVID-19 is, is actually extremely low, even though we do have some ongoing uh, transmission. Uh, it's, it's believed that the total number of people infected is very low. We don't actually have that number because we're not testing every single individual in a defined population to get a sense of what that prevalence is. Um, what we do know is that in Ontario, for example, right now, we're seeing less than 200 new cases of people with symptoms who are tested positive with COVID-19 coming forward every day. Um, so given the size of our population, that's a very low risk. In the US, it's quite different and, and different parts of the US that are opening up to businesses and, and sort of opening up uh, the communities are experiencing large resurgences um, like what we're seeing in Florida, for example. All I can say is that it's about your individual behaviors and your risk of getting COVID-19 is highest when you're in closed quarters or small, more contained areas with people who could be infectious. So, um, you know, I think that that's an important piece to take home in terms of risk of your, of your exposure. Um, I'm going to go to a question that I have here. It, it's for Dr. Abby. Um, for those who lost a family member to COVID-19, what can they do to help them through the grieving process? And I, I, I think, uh, Susan, it, it is also about how can we help people who are feeling isolated? I think, for example, uh, our elders are in long-term care communities that are not allowing visitors in. So it's about grief, loneliness. Oh, you're on mute, Susan. <laughs> Sorry, I you know I, I, I feel so for people because I think, you know, particularly for people who've lost somebody, there are so many parts of our culture that um, that help with that and, and we can't use any of them right now. Um, and so 
I think it is around really trying to reach out to, to the people that you know and that you know the person who you lost to be able to talk uh, to talk about them, to find new, what's almost finding new ways of grieving. So I've got uh, one person who I know is just filling notebooks after notebooks of, with stories about their loved one or um, developing, uh, because we haven't been able to have the standard rituals, potentially developing your own ritual or making plans for something that can happen once we are able to come together in groups. Um, and I think for the rest of us, it's really thinking about if we've got people like that in our life, how can we, how can we remember to include them? How can we reach out? How can we connect with them? Um, it's been very interesting. I think it's often harder for people who are feeling isolated to reach out uh, than for you know people who feel connected. But the people who feel connected need to need to remember to the ones who are more isolated and try to try to connect. Um, and I think at this period in time, um, those feelings of isolation are uh, are really widely shared. They're not uh, even even amongst people who are living with other people that there is something that is so challenging about this experience for us. And so I think having somebody that you can um, connect with or somebody's is really helpful. And I, I know I've also had a number of people who are connecting with, you don't want to connect with people who are in your past for good reason, right? Because <laughs> you want to keep them in your past. But there, there are lots of often of people who, you know, you think, well, I haven't talked to them in a long time. And People really seem to appreciate getting a call and saying, you know, I had the call from somebody from high school and they were telling me they've been thinking about me. And, you know, it just feels, it, I think for all of us, it feels nice to know that other people are thinking about us. Thanks. I'm going to go to Dr. Bailey next. Uh, Mark, I was fascinated by the idea of the fair app. Can you talk a bit more about how they might be evaluating that? Because that, that would be well worth thinking through. Yeah, so it's, um, it's a group of therapists, and they have, what they did is they looked at how, um, first of all, they can tell you, is the app for price or is it free? And so they, that's an important uh, consideration for many, many people. Um, the next thing they do is they look at um, what kind of condition it works for. So people with stroke or brain injury or people who are just looking to improve their diabetes care. So I like that fact about it. The other thing it'll do is they do actually use it and they invite users to give, similar to other rating scales you might like, like TripAdvisor, they, they ask users as well as their own experts to try the app and, and, and tell you whether they found it easy to use. And so I found that it's kind of an objective way of trying to give you an idea of which of these health apps are very helpful for your use. Thanks. I'm going to go to uh, Dr. Hota next. Uh, there are a number of questions that I have here about returning to the workplace, things like elevators, um, things like um, your, cell phone, your cell phone. How? What are some of the common things that could be have a virus load or viral load that you can actually um, take precautions and, and uh, what should workplaces be doing, Susie? That's a great question. So when you Think about what areas of your environment can be the most contaminated. We refer to something called high touch surfaces and it's exactly what you think it is. It's the areas that you tend to touch. So, you know, the, um, the armrests of your chair, uh, the door handles, elevator buttons are definitely amongst those. And of course, cell phones and other devices that we uh, use all the time. Um, so, you know, the kind of practical advice that I would tell people is all workplaces should be enhancing their cleaning of surfaces that are high touch. So things like elevator buttons, there needs to be, I mean, those are long neglected. We probably never clean them in many workplaces prior to this, but we need to pay attention to those kinds of surfaces and have them wiped down frequently. Um, but the most important thing you can do that you're in control of is cleaning your hands frequently. So if you have your own hand sanitizer with you um, and workplaces should definitely consider trying to facilitate hand hygiene in, in their environment, then if you can clean your hands, frequently before you're holding your phone, touching your phone, you don't have to worry about how do I disinfect this sensitive piece of equipment. Um, so uh, questions that have come in, and again for Dr. Hota, one is about uh, the immunoglobulin plasma therapy and how effective it is, and then somebody's asking if you could elaborate on the food connection to COVID-19. Sure. 
So the hyperimmune globulin um, convalescent plasma being used as a treatment is very experimental. And to date, there's really been less than 10 studies that are published on this topic involving very small numbers of patients, so less than 50 patients. So it's very difficult to draw conclusions. Um, the conditions under which these studies were, were done and these reports were, were made are quite diverse. So we, you know, there could be other factors that affect the outcome. And ultimately, in a, a very nice rapid review that was published in, by the Cochrane Group, they could draw no conclusions as to how effective um, plasma therapy would be. Uh, whether it reduces people's risk of dying or improves their outcomes. Um, so I think right now we're just waiting for more trials to come through that are more controlled so we can get an answer as to whether or not this could be an effective treatment. And um, uh, I, I should just say, uh, for those who don't know, that's when you take um, the plasma from somebody who had COVID-19 and may have an immune uh, response and give it to somebody who currently has COVID-19. Yes, thank you, Jill. So I'll, I'll just quickly <laughs> elaborate on that. So that's really what we call sort of passive immunity. When I talked about how do you get immunity from this virus, so I talked about natural immunity, if you get infected and develop your own immunity to it versus vaccine. Uh, one of the things I didn't talk about is, uh, is this concept of getting antibodies from the blood of people who've already recovered from an illness and trying to give that to people to see if that can help fight off the infection. Um, in those who were affected by that illness at the time. So it is something that's being looked at along with a number of other types of uh, therapies that are experimental. So we are reaching the end of our hour and I'm sensitive that people on here have given us an hour. Um, I'm going to go to each one of you, uh, Dr. Abby, one sort of sentence of advice to people. Just be super kind to yourself. These are really hard times, but we're gonna get we're going to get through them and uh, and think about how you want to be able to look back and tell uh, tell your children and grandchildren about how you got through the time. Dr. Hota. I would say keep yourself informed. And I know this might be a little converse to what Susan mentioned about being careful about reading the news and such. I, I understand it can be triggering at times, but we need to know what's going on around us because, um, you know, keeping yourself safe and trying to balance the risk is going to be dependent on what the current state is in your region. So keep informed. And finally, Dr. Bailey. Thanks. I would say that it's time for all, us all to take care of our health and reach out to the healthcare system because we really want to reach out to you and uh, take advantage of the new way of providing healthcare that we're trying to work through. So in closing, uh, thank you for the great session. I think there are lots of practical uh, tips there for people. Um, important takeaways uh, for taking care of ourselves. Uh, something that I, I know personally, uh, I used to go to the gym a lot and I haven't been and now I'm paying the price for that. So it's kind of getting out and walking. I want to thank Drs. Susie Hota, Susan Abbey and Mark Bailey for joining us today and giving us their time. This uh, seminar has been recorded and it will be available to you next week. If you would uh, like to see other sessions, we have archived all the previous webinars on our Toronto Rehab Foundation uh, website. For those who would like to participate in one of Toronto Rehab Foundation's fundraising events, we are joining people from across, um, the, I guess, across the city and across the um, uh, province in, in doing some things and you can see some of that information on the screen. The Walk of Life is a virtual event in support of cardiac health this Saturday, June uh, 27th. Thank you again to our generous sponsors for supporting the Blakely Health Innovation Series. We will be taking a break over the next couple of months. It's the summer and I'm sure people are trying to get outside but we look forward to sharing with all of you our next series in the fall. And before I end this webinar, I want to wish everyone a safe and wonderful summer. And uh, I know Dr. Hoda would say, wash your hands a lot. And Susan would say, take care of yourself, keep calm. And Mark would remind us, if you really need care in the emergency department, go to the emergency department. Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs>